Hello, everybody. Hello, London. Um, I am Adrienne Braganza Tucker, and today I want to talk to you about this infamous emoji. Who here has given this emoji in a code review? Who has regretted giving that emoji? <laughs> this, if those of you that may not be familiar with it, stands for LGTM, the infamous acronym that we sometimes are hoping for, but most of the time we get in uh, ways that we may not want to talk about, stands for looks good to me. And in the context of a code review, we typically want to say this when we mean code is passing muster. It is ready to proceed in the process. It is safe. Uh, it looks good to me. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it. But believe me, there's a lot wrong with code reviews. In fact, there's so much wrong with code reviews that I actually wrote an entire book on it. <laughs> I really, really, really wanted to get back to basics and talk about what we could do better in our code reviews. And so this is going to be the railroad whistle stop tour of all the best parts of my book in this talk. So we're going to talk about what exactly are we doing wrong in our code reviews? How do we fix those things? And then once we have actually established that, because I believe in order for code reviews to be effective, we should be doing all the things we're about to talk about, we can go beyond bare minimum code reviews in a lot of cool different ways. So what are we doing wrong? I'm just going to pause there. I'm sure there's a couple moments that you're thinking about in your head. Maybe something just happened yesterday. In order to think about what we do wrong in code reviews, we have to look at it through two perspectives. We have to look at it through the reviewer perspective and both the author's perspective. So we'll first start with the reviewer, because there are plenty of things that we might assume, that we think we know, but really we're doing these things wrong. Number one is not leaving your ego at the door. So code reviews, a lot of folks that I have spoken to have said they really, really dread it. Um, they think it's just a critique that they are going to send this precious code that they've written and just get attacked, that it's an attacking process. Or sometimes they have colleagues who are, you know, they're the, well, actually, or this is going to be a better thing to do, or, 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 or. Who has a colleague like that that's in code reviews? Who's, who's sitting next to them, that's why they can't just point them out. That's exactly why we don't like code reviews, you know? We dread maybe one specific person or the way that we're doing them. And so not leaving your ego at the door is one of the most uh, problematic and annoying things that we do wrong as reviewers. The next thing that we do that kind of is synonymous with that is focusing on the developer rather than the code. So when we do get comments or feedback on our code reviews, they sometimes feel like you know, virtual tomatoes being thrown in our face. Why did you do this? This is a stupid way to implement this. Yada, yada, yada. And sometimes that is a really, really difficult thing to deal with. Somebody who's new, somebody who's new to the team, somebody who's new to programming in general, all of these things do not make for a good code review. Interestingly, in a study done on code review comments where they were trying to detect interpersonal conflict in issues and code reviews, they took a look and one finding was that the use of second person pronouns at the beginning of the sentence is more likely to be seen as impolite. So when they looked at all of these thousands of comments and code reviews, they distributed them to what were known as toxic comments and what were known as non-toxic comments. So they spread out all of the words found in those categories and they spread them out into these charts. These are statistically more likely to be in toxic comments and these are statistically likely to be in non-toxic comments. You'll notice that in the toxic area, there's a whole bunch of mentioning of the developer. You, you, if you, you think, you are, do you think, do you need to. The only exception here in the non-toxic area is for could you, which is more of a way to politely ask for a change. But other than that, most toxic comments reference the developer in some way. Next, one of the 
problematic things that we do as reviewers is skim through reviews. <laughs> it's Friday. I have PTO coming up. And that's a problem because as reviewers, we have some responsibility to give a proper review. What is the point of doing a code review if we're not going to do it thoroughly at all or look at the code at all? One of the things that I think this is is because reviewers have this mindset, some reviewers do, that if the developer has a bug in their code, it's their fault. So even if it goes through, even if there's a production fire, it's not on me, it's the dev. They need to fix their stuff. And that is a mindset that we should be trying to change. The last thing that we do, and one of the things I think is the most important things that we should be doing but are doing wrong, is writing ineffective comments. Ineffective comments are the causes of really long code reviews. Ineffective comments and ineffective communication in general could mean really, really long debates with colleagues. And Writing comments in a way that don't put you on the same page faster just makes the code review process something that we continue to dread. When ineffective comments are written, they usually have these attributes. They are subjective, so return the result in an array instead. And that's it, you don't tell me why, just do this. Or they're unclear, like this could be better. or they lack an outcome. Uh, there's something wrong here. So when they're subjective, unclear, or lack an outcome, they're really, really ineffective for the author to do something with. And that is something that we do incorrectly as reviewers. So to recap, reviewers, we don't leave our ego at the door, we focus on the developer rather than the code, we skim through reviews, and we write really, really ineffective comments. So how do we fix those things? Well, number one, forget your ego. <laughs> I don't care if you're a senior, I don't care if you're an architect, I don't care if you're a junior, I don't care if you're a contractor, that has no place in the code review. Alongside of that, focus on the code, not the developer. We're here to review the code. We're here to check for high stakes issues. We're here to see, is there an edge case that's missing? Is there something that will not make the rest of the code base healthy if we were to let this go through? That's what we should be focusing on. If we go back to that study that detected toxic versus non-toxic comments, another interesting finding there is that many software engineering related engrams, or the words in the comments, are among the non-toxic comments. So if we go back to those, in the non-toxic comments, the words that focused either on the code itself or on the pull request, these are more likely to be labeled as non-toxic because you're focusing on the code rather than the developer. Next, we need to give proper thorough reviews. It doesn't matter if it's Friday, it doesn't matter if we have vacation, it is our responsibility to give a review if we have been assigned one. So one of the things I hear is that, oh, it's such a bottleneck, or it takes too much time, or it's a really difficult PR to review. And some of the things we can fix about that on our side is to review code in 25 to 45 minute focus bursts. Now for some people, this might be way past their threshold of when they can focus, and for others, that means it's a lot shorter. But reviewing code that is within these limits assures that you don't lose focus and that you're able to give a proper review and look at all the code in the PR that you have been assigned. Another thing that we should be doing more often is to not be afraid to send back PRs that are too large to review. So it is not fair for us, a single person or two people or three people, to be expected to properly review 500 files or 827 lines of code change. There's no way that we can really thoroughly review that in the way that an author might expect us to. So try to discuss with your team that smaller PRs are better, which we will get to with the author's responsibilities, but that big PRs are just not something that we can properly review or are, can be expected to review. Alongside of that, remember the mindset where we said, well, you know, even if I approve this and something goes wrong, it's the developer's fault. That's not the mindset that we should have. The mindset we should have as reviewers is, how did I miss that? 
because we have a responsibility. We should be accountable for the code that goes through our review. So we have a shared responsibility. The author has the responsibility to write the best code that they can, the most well-tested code that they can, and then it's our responsibility as the reviewer to make sure we are those extra set of eyes, those extra set of checks that make sure that we did not miss anything that the original author may have missed. Lastly, writing effective comments. If there's anything you take away from this, it is this section right here. So put your phones down, put your laptops down, take screenshots of this, maybe pick up your phones for that. But write effective comments. That is the thing that we need to do as reviewers. Effective comments are the opposite of what I told you are where ineffective comments. They're objective, they're as specific as possible, and they have a focused outcome. So what does this mean in the context of being a reviewer? Well, reviewers need to be objective. Remember, we focus on the code, we don't focus on the developer or anything else. Alongside of that, being objective means suggesting with facts. So earlier we had a comment that said, return the result in an array. Tell me why I need to return it in an array rather than what the current implementation is. Another thing to think about is before you ask for a change, meaning before you leave feedback for an author to do some sort of update or rework, ask yourself, why do you want to make that change? In a different study that looked at this, they found that if developers just chilled out, <laughs> looked at it, and reviewers thought about it for a minute, said, why am I asking somebody to make this change? it resulted in one of two outcomes. Either they are absolutely positively sure that this change is needed, they have made sense of it in their head, and they have justified it, and that means that they can now articulate it much better in the comment because they know what they are trying to ask for. On the other hand, if they are thinking about it, going through it, looking at it, sometimes they find the change is not needed at all they actually can't make sense of what they're trying to ask for. They don't know what they're trying to ask for, and thus that would not ever come out clearly in a comment. So sometimes you just throw that away. You don't even leave that as a comment at all. So pause for a moment before you ask somebody to make a change and just try to make sure you know what you're asking for. As reviewers, we also need to be specific. So being specific is being clear if something needs to be done. For example, who here uses nitpicks in their code reviews? I hope I don't see any hands. They're like, <laughs> nitpicks, for those who don't know, and at least the way my team considers them, are things that are not really of any value in the code review. They're very subjective. They're things that should not hold or block the pull request from being approved or going through the process. They're nitpicks. They're things that are purely preferential by the reviewer. But the thing is, by labeling it a picnic, a uh, picnic, <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> Just gonna sit right here, start eating. A nitpick is something that we can clearly see that I may not really have to look at. It's not as important. It's not a high stake issue that I have to address right now. And as an author, that is really crucial to be able to get the pull request or code review and especially addressing feedback to go faster because we know that this is something I need to address versus something I don't need to address. My team used these three. One is needs change, meaning there's a small change that needs to happen, maybe a small update to the PR. Sometimes there were things that were way out of scope. It did not require uh, just a simple change. In fact, it required way more rework. So then we use needs rework. And typically, we would take this discussion offline to discuss what else needed to be done. And then, because we had this one senior who would just, they needed to have nitpicks, we had nitpicks in the list as well. Another way to do this is something called conventional comments. Who here has heard of conventional commits? Okay, a few. Conventional comments was created by a uh, Paul Slaughter, and I got the chance to speak to him. He said he created this within the span of three hours. Uh, he works at GitLab, and he's like, I didn't know it was gonna blow up to be this, this large. But what conventional comments do, and I apologize, this is a little dark to read, but the essence of this is that there is a format for your comments. 
you have a label, you have a decoration, and then you have the comment itself. And the label, much like what we use, the needs work or needs uh, change or nitpick was the label. Then they have optional decorations, which you could use to further specify what exactly this is mean. So you could use this for operating system or the project that you're talking about, or even the one that I really like to see is blocking versus non-blocking. These are really, really great pieces of information, again, for the author to know, hey, I need to do something about this, and or I don't need to do something about this, and to also quickly categorize what the focus is of this piece of feedback. So conventional comments are another way to try to be more specific in your feedback. And as the last point, I think we do this now, and most tools allow for this, but pinpoint what you are talking about. So only highlight relevant code that you are discussing. If you're only talking about a specific part of logic in lines 22 to 23, please only highlight lines 22 to 23. Do not highlight the entire function. Uh, explicitly call out the method or the variable names or the class names that you are talking about. And then if necessary, actually call out the line numbers to be more succinct. Again, what we're trying to do is to get the author to understand us much faster. If you can be so clear in what you mean, then this back and forth may not have to go so long, so far, and you can get the review going much faster. Finally, as reviewers, we need to provide a focused outcome. So if we go back to that study on code review comments, language matters, this one actually took a look at if comments were useful versus not useful. And one finding that I found interesting there was that apparently the useful comments contain mostly verbs of some sort of transformation. So taking that, I have developed something I call the triple R pattern. I have now heard various variations of this. They call it the, the R cubed pattern, the R pattern, like a pirate. Uh, and if you have any other ones, please, I want to add to this collection. But I, I'm going to do triple R. Triple R pattern is really, really great if you want to structure your feedback, especially when you are asking for a change. Triple R means you have a request, you have the rationale behind the request, and you have the result, if it will update. There we go. So request, what is it that you are asking the author to do? Rationale, explaining why you want them to make this change. And result, a measurable end state that the author can compare to. So the rationale could be team conventions, a blog post you found, a Stack Overflow answer that you see that supports your case, and the result could be something like, what is the actual metric they have to attain? What is a screenshot if it's something that's a visual component that they need to uh, attain? Or even the code itself if you're maybe refactoring it for somebody that is a junior. These are all really helpful ways for the author to understand what it is you're asking them to change. So if we put this into an example, let's say you're asking somebody to move a method. Request, can we move the authenticate library method into our library? Why? Well, we have three objective facts here. One, we have similar methods that are already in the library. Two, we have called this more than a few times, which warrants its place in the library. And three, we have a team working agreement that says this kind of code goes into that library. So the result, you, you can forego this. It should be pretty clear what the result is that you're asking for. But if not, you can specify we should make all of these calls through the library rather than standalone. As another example, let's say you want to request a more meaningful variable name. Request, rename the variable item to something less ambiguous. <laughs> Rationale, well, the current item the current item is really, really vague. It doesn't capture the notion of the surrounding scope of the code, and it is a bit unclear. Result, here, here is where you now suggest what a more meaningful variable name might be. If you had just gone straight in and said, you should probably change this to this, that might be okay for some teams, but when you have built the case for why you would want to change it to that, the author is more likely to just you know, accept that particular meaningful name. 
But remember, you ask two developers to give a variable name to something, they're probably gonna come up with two different things because meaningful means two different things to do different developers. But this is one case where you might be able to sway that opinion. And then lastly, sometimes you have discussions that are just going nowhere, right? You are three, four, five, six, eight, 20 comments long, the thread is getting really long, take it offline because you're just going like this online. There's so much context lost offline, tone, body language, you're just not getting across what you need to get across online, so take it offline. If you are in person, you know, tap that person on the shoulder, have a quick chat, I guarantee you, you will resolve it much faster. Or if you are a remote situation, ask if you can have a really quick video chat to just talk it out. And then the one thing most people forget when they have this offline conversation is once you have found the outcome of that conversation, go back to that PR and simply add a comment of the result of that conversation. Because now you don't silo that information in the discussion that you've just had. And now anybody else that looks at the PR later on, yourselves included, will know what happened, what led to this. I saw that it went offline, you talked about it offline, but what was the outcome of it? Was new work done? Was an update made to this PR? Going back after any offline conversation to just quickly update it with a summary is going to help so much with a lot of that siloed information. So reviewers, forget your ego, focus on the code, not the developer. Proper thorough reviews are a must, especially because we have some responsibility as reviewers and we need to write effective comments. So now we know what we're doing as reviewers, right? Give me a thumbs up if we know what we're doing as reviewers. All right. Now, what are we doing wrong as authors? There's a lot. Number one, not being your own first reviewer. How many times have you updated your pull request because you found something silly? You forgot some debugging code, you forgot a file, you didn't add a link. How many times have you like updated, continue to update your pull requests? Okay, everybody else who didn't raise their hand, they're perfect all the time, I guess. But not being your own first reviewer means you don't catch all of these little things. And again, not catching these little things means the, pull, the code review itself takes a lot longer because now the reviewer has to come back and ask you, what did this mean? What is this? Are you missing this? So being your own first reviewer is something that we do wrong. Not being your own first reviewer. The next thing we don't do correctly is to not use any automation at all during development. Automation meaning any type of linting, any type of formatting, any type of static analysis, and any type of automated testing. When we have tools at our disposal to solve problems before the code review, we should be using them. I don't know how, I don't know any developer who likes to debate formatting and spacing in a code review. And I don't know if reviewers like pointing those out either. It's a waste of time. These are low stakes issues not the high stakes issues that we want to be looking for in a code review. So anytime you have these pieces of automation available, you should use them. The next thing that we do wrong, making your PR unmanageable. Unmanageable just means they are way too large, way too many files, changes are not atomic, or you have multiple parts of a large feature in a single PR. So anytime PRs are that large, it's probably not a great time for the reviewer. One other thing to add insult to injury, sometimes you leave your PRs as a mystery novel. Who has received a PR like this to review? <laughs> nothing, nothing, no scraps, nothing, just bug fix. And again, you are not setting up the reviewer for success. You don't know what mindset to go into as a reviewer here. So now you're adding more time to the review because you're asking the reviewer to now come talk to you and ask you, what did you mean? What is this? Just you do not leave them as a mystery. And finally, what we do wrong is leaving or tying our worth to our code. So, you know, as developers or anybody that may write code, sometimes we see code as an extension of ourselves. 
We say we've worked so long to craft the perfect solution. We put it up for review and somebody has the audacity to leave feedback on it. What do you mean? It's perfect. So anytime we receive feedback, sometimes we might feel like that's an attack or that we're not good enough. And this not, may not apply to everybody, but there are a lot of folks who do feel this way in a code review. So as an author, these are the, all the things that we do wrong. We're not our own first reviewer. We don't use any automation during development. We make our PRs really unmanageable. We treat them as mystery novels, and we may tie our worth to our code. How do we fix those things? Be your own first reviewer. Just like you may double check your email before you send it out, triple, quadruple check, I know I do. Make sure everything that you need is there. Make sure the context is there. Make sure no little mistakes are there. Anticipate what the reviewer might look for and make sure that information is there. Be your own first reviewer. Also, let the robots take over during development. So, Patrick mentioned that sometimes we may have some tools to help us, and I think these are not necessarily AI, but these are tools that can help us. Does anyone here know the show Captain Planet? Yes. yes. So hopefully you understand my meme here. So with the powers of formatting, automated testing, static analysis, and you, a pro, and linting, and you, the pro automation developer, you will get rid of all of these annoying code review issues. So, you know, they put all the rings together, some of them. So do all of those things. Next, make PRs manageable, AKA make them smaller. What is a manageable PR? These are some guidelines. They focus on an atomic change or feature. They include only what is necessary for the code to work. They are split into multiple parts for multiple reviews. They can likely be reviewed in 10 to 20 minutes. And in a study by principal engineer Dragan Stepanovic, he found that typically under 500 lines of code is a better code review because it is more, uh, because people leave more comments on the review. And some of you are like, more comments? That doesn't sound like a great review. What, what we found is that the less lines of code, the more engaged and the more focused the person actually is in reviewing your code, which means there are more likely to be useful comments left on your code review. Also, in a different study by Microsoft, they found that typically less than 20 files changed are also a manageable PR. They have found that developers found pull requests that have this amount or fewer, they found it useful. They found the code review to do what it's supposed to do. They didn't find it a bottleneck because it was manageable, and they found that they could do the pull requests without making it feel like a drain. As a shortcut, you know, if all those things are already in your place, just think about how you design features in your planning and designing phases. Because in the end, if you design smaller features, you will likely gain smaller PRs. So limit the scope, really spell out explicitly your acceptance criteria, make those features as atomic as possible, or make those work stories or tasks as small as possible so that the resulting PR is small and manageable. Finally, solve the mystery. Let your PRs tell the story. You are the beholder of the, how long your PR is gonna last. <laughs> if you put little effort, it's probably gonna take longer because the reviewer is gonna take more effort to figure out what it is you're trying to ask for. When I think about this, there's a quote from Yamamoto Tsunetomo, and he says, when one is writing a letter, he should think that the recipient will make it into a hanging scroll. So it should be so context-filled, it should have labels, it should have links, it should have pre-checks, pre-build things running, it should be so clear that anytime you reference this in the future, or anybody that looks at this can make sense of it. That's how clearly we need to write our PRs. And finally, remind yourself that you are not your code. We ask reviewers not to focus on us and to only focus on the code. We need to do the same thing, focus on the code and not the feedback that you are receiving. Feedback is, constructive feedback is a way for us to, is an opportunity for the code base to improve as a whole. So we should not be taking any type of feedback as an attack on ourselves. So now we, are knowing what we should do. Be our own first reviewer, let the robots take over, let PRs be manageable, 
let the PRs tell the story and remind yourself that you are not your code. So now we all know what we're doing. And now we need to go beyond. And we're going to go lightning fast because I think I only have 30 seconds left. <laughs> so create a team working agreement. Make implicit expectations explicit. What does that mean? Spell out your workflow. What is your actual code review? What are the steps involved in it? What are your states of PR review and which ones do you use? Do you use draft? Do you use ready for review? Do you use other states? Make sure you define what those are and spell out what your blocking versus non-blocking issues are. So many debates have happened because they think I can hold this review because they need to address this specific thing. And if you get along with your team and decide beforehand what you are allowed to block a pull request on versus what not, then you can reference this as you do your code reviews in the future. If possible, use PR templates. This has helped so many people capture the information that they need and to get all the information they need. So for a bug fix, you may ask for all these things. What are the root causes? What is this testing strategy impact? It's a markdown file where you can basically have someone checklist that self-acknowledge that they have all the information they need for a particular pull request. If possible, auto assign reviewers. So Google code owners, which is a file that lets you um, add specific people automatically to code reviews based on a file pattern. And you can also do this in Azure DevOps. Explore informational reviewers, people who don't necessarily have to approve a pull request, but are added because they need to get that knowledge sharing or knowledge transfer and to be aware of what's happening in the code. And finally, code complements are encouraged within reason. Don't do it for every comment. Do it for something novel. Somebody really figured out a novel solution. Somebody solved the bug that has been plaguing your team for five months. Those are the kinds of code complements that are great. Don't settle with your code reviews. Strive for great ones, London. Tom Thank you so much.